All right, if you just came uh, today just to hear that song be sung over you, that the Lord would awake our souls to come alive, oh, man, that would be enough for me. So this is this will just be gravy then. Um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be gravy, not leftovers. So we'll, we'll, we'll hope for it, okay? Um, hey, I, th- I think today's a day worth celebrating for a couple reasons. Uh, one is we get to be together, but the second is this is the last Sunday of 2020. And, and what that means is, is 2020 is almost behind us. That's right. And I was, I was trying to reflect as I prepared to talk after Christmas, thinking about the new year, um, thinking about how, how do we capture 2020 and what it's been? And I stumbled across a few memes uh, that I think might help us be able to capture 2020. So here's the first one. Um, is, is if 2020 were a pinata, I think it's a good one. Uh, the next, this is, a, this, is, this is great. If 2020 were a scented candle, maybe you've seen that one. If 2020 were a slide, some of you kids at home watching with your parents, maybe you have felt like that. Uh, and, and my favorite, if 2020 were a game, just catch it. Little, little whack-a-mole. These are funny, I think, uh, and we've probably all stumbled across something that has summed up 2020 that has made us laugh. And, and the laughter is helpful, uh, but if we're really honest with ourselves, this has not been a real fun year. It's, it's been a difficult year, and, and usually we come to the end of the year, and for some of us, we are just longing for a new year to come. And it, it just, it, maybe some of us would have a good year, or, and some of us had a bad year. This year, we come to the end, and it's like as a community, we gather, we've all kind of had the same year to a certain degree. We are all, are all longing to start fresh and start new, and in thinking about that, it's like, how do we reflect on 2020, but then have hope for 2021? And, and the Lord brought me to a little passage of scripture in Isaiah that I want to spend a little bit of time with us today talking about, because I think it sums up how we can prepare ourselves for 2021. And, and why it does that is because the Israelites have been in a very similar situation as us, except for this. It hasn't just been a bad year. It's been a bad decade. And it actually hasn't just been a bad decade. It's been a bad number of decades, almost 70 years. And the Lord comes to them and wants to speak to them in their 2020. You see, what it would have been like for Israel is uh, they have been in captivity in Babylon for the last number of years. And they're not certain what they're going to do. They're scattered. Like us, they have not been able to worship at church or gather at the temple. And they didn't have the liberty, for those of you who are watching online right now, to actually tune in. They would have lived in a time of a political and economic uncertainty and upheaval, And it is in the midst of Israel's 2020 that the Lord comes to them and he gives them a word, a word that is meant to sustain them, a word that is meant to give them hope for the future. And so we'll we'll dig right in uh, to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 15. And if you've got a, a Bible, I'll let you turn there or pull it up on your phone. And it starts... Uh, by saying this, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, And they lay there 
never to rise again. Extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me and the jackals and owls because I provide water in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you not, have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. This, this word that the Lord gives to Israel in the midst of their 2020, he starts by reminding them of a couple things. He starts by reminding them of who he is. I am the Lord. I am the Holy One. I am set apart. There is no one like me. I am the creator. I I made everything you see. I am your king. I am the one you look to for provision, for protection. I am the one who leads you. Reminds them of who he is. And then he reminds them of what he's done. He, he, he brings them back to a time in their history when, when the Lord did something miraculous. And, and he calls Moses to go to Egypt and to rescue the nation from slavery with Pharaoh. And with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, it tells us, the Lord saves the Israelites from Egypt by Moses taking a little stick putting it in the water, and the Red Sea splits. And the whole Israelite community cross on the other side. And when that happens, as soon as they get the other side, the waters come in and destroy Israel's Israel's enemies, snuffed out. The passage starts by reminding us who God is and what God did at the Red Sea. And this is common, if you're familiar with the scriptures, and some of you might not be, God continually brings Israel back to this moment. The Exodus, what we call the Red Sea, where this happened, is a moment that God keeps bringing them back to over and over and over again. And so why why does he remind them of this story? Why does he remind them of this story? Well, fellas, it's the same reason why your wife or sister continues to remind you to put the toilet seat down. Same reason. Teenagers, it's the exact same reason that your parents are always reminding you to turn the lights off when you leave a room. You do not remind people about something unless they've forgotten. They've forgotten. The nation of Israel has forgotten the miraculous work that God's done. And you, you would think with me, I mean, we could probably sometimes think about that story like that. Like, that would be mind-blowing. I mean, imagine, imagine someone partying Sylvan Lake, and you are there. I mean, mind-blowing. How do they forget such a miraculous event in their history? I think they forget, just like we are prone to forget when we have a year like 2020. We are prone to forget the moment that God awakened us, the moment that God actually saved us out of the land of slavery and did something new in us. We're prone to forget how God answered prayer. We are, we're prone to forget the time that God spoke something really clearly to us. And after a time of difficulty, we just move on. And as I was preparing uh, to share this message, I got in the middle of this and got this point of like, oh yeah, all you people, you're just so prone to forget. Come on, remember what God's done. And the Lord just said, 
hold on there, sucker. <laughs> hold up. I believe I did something recently that you have forgotten. A, a couple months ago, uh, our house got broken into. And uh, you, we were doing the thing that you do when your house gets broken into. You go through the rooms and you make your little list of uh, what, what got taken. And so we're going through and we're making the list of what got taken. And it dawns on us. These wonderful human beings who broke into our house decided not only to steal our computers, but they got the ex- our backup, our external hard drive. And as soon as we realized the external hard drive was gone, Julie and I were gutted because for you millennials out there who have grown up mainly with an iPhone most of your life, um, there was a time when we couldn't get everything on the cloud. So we had all of our stuff was backed up on this external hard drive, wedding pictures, great memories, all of our master's schoolwork, our lectures, presentations we created, important documents. And Julie and I, that stuff matters to us. It was stuff like, it was like, we're never going to get that back. We're so gutted. And, and we, we're so, we were frustrated and we, you know, we were praying and we, we did everything we could, right? You go out in the woods behind, we went out in the woods behind our house. We're looking through all the trails, seeing maybe if they tossed it. We go down to Rotary Park, which is right by our house. We're looking through garbage cans. We go to the pawn shops. It's like we are searching for this thing and we're asking the Lord to do a miracle. And it just happened uh, through a couple different events. I got to have a conversation with a young man downtown. And the next day, I just felt prompted that I, I I should just take one more peek out in the woods by our house, where I had already gone. And so I went for the walk, and it's right there, in the middle of the woods, right before we had that massive snowstorm. And I pick it, and it's like, oh my goodness. You know, you kind of look around like, it's like, I've won the lottery. In fact, no, you didn't. This just belonged to you before. But you just feel like, you just feel like a million bucks And that was two months ago, God did the miraculous and brought back my hard drive, and I've already moved on. I have allowed the difficulty and the challenge of COVID, the difficulty and challenge of my present circumstances to make me forgetful. And I think we can so easily allow the difficulty of 2020, the virus, in our current circumstances to cause us to have amnesia, to have amnesia. And this should not be so. The Lord calls us to remember what he's done so that we can have faith to enter into the present challenge. I mean, this isn't isn't just the Bible that thinks it's important to remember. If you look at the stories that our culture tells, Some of the most important stories in our culture talk about remembering. Over Christmas break, I watched Captain Marvel for the first time. Some of you are like, that's been out for like a year. I know, I've been busy, I have little children, so we've been watching Winnie the Pooh, so I just got through all those. Now I can watch Captain Marvel. And in that story, it tells us that in order for her to be able to hit the current crisis, in order for her to be able to save the world, she has to be able to remember what's gone on in the past. You see, when we don't look back at what God has done, we are not ready to face the present. You and I cannot face the challenges of 2020 or prepare ourselves for 2021 if we have faith amnesia, if we've forgotten what God has done, what have you forgotten? The new year's coming and we, we're prone to think about new beginnings, new memories, 
We want to think about starting over, and some of us will think about New Year's resolutions. We'll come up with new hobbies or habits, or maybe some of us will try to shed a little bit of the oh, quarantine 15 that we have put on over the break. That's why I'm wearing black today. But instead of looking forward as we approach 2021, what would it look like for us to begin the year by looking backward? What can't we afford to forget? What has God spoken? What have we seen him do? Where has he answered prayer that we need to remember to give us faith in order to enter in to 2021? I think this concept of remembering is so important in order to anchor us as we look at here. That I actually, I'm gonna pause right here. If you're at home, and you're here with us right now, I just want you to take a few minutes, actually a few seconds, 20-ish. What can't you afford to forget? What has God done that you can't afford to forget? When you close your eyes, allow the Rolodex to go. Holy Spirit, we're asking right now as we take a pause that you remind us right now, what is one thing that we cannot afford to forget that you've done as we prepare for 2021? What's interesting in this passage is, is right after we are told to remember, the scripture says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Now, right after we're told to remember what God's done, we are to, we're told to forget what we've just read. Some of you are thinking, well, did you just waste 15 minutes of my time? I have so much to do during lockdown today. I would like it back. I promise you, I did not waste your time. The point of remembering what God has done is to bolster our faith, to help us recall that God is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. The point of forgetting in this passage is to not get stuck in thinking that the miraculous ways that God has saved in the past and worked in the past is the exact same way he is gonna do it again. In this case, the Israelites are paying attention. In their exile in Babylon, they want God to do the miraculous the same way he did it with Moses. They are looking for a Red Sea moment. They're asking the Lord to drop the same play, bring Moses in with the stick, Part the Red Sea for us. And God says, I'm not gonna do that. Forget the former, I'm gonna do a new thing. So why, why won't God do it the same way he did it before? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first reason is this, and it doesn't seem very spiritual. Partly it's because God is creative. In the character statement that we started with in verse 15, it said that God is creator meaning at the very heart of God is creativity. God loves to do new things. God loves to throw surprise parties. God loves to blow people's minds with beauty. Creativity is a core aspect of God's identity. The second reason, which seems a little bit more theological, is he's not gonna rescue us the same way as before because he doesn't want us to become tied to a certain method. Because when we get tied to a certain method of rescue, we miss out. We can miss out on what God really wants to do in our lives. And if you think about it, this is kind of how Christmas goes, right? The story of Christmas. All of the Israelite nation are waiting for the Messiah to come. They're waiting for God to come rescue them. And they're, they're watching over here for a certain type of Messiah. They want the Messiah who's gonna come with the commando boots and the fatigues 
and is gonna whoop Rome and deliver them and then set up a kingdom. And so they're watching, they're waiting. And they've seen all these other guys who have come in their history who have done these military campaigns as maybe this is the guy. And as they're paying attention over here to that method, God says, "Uh uh-uh. I'm actually doing something over here. I'm doing a new thing. I'm gonna bring you a little baby who in and of himself has no strength to start. He's gonna be fully man and fully God and he is going to do a new thing. I'm gonna bring you a little baby who, who isn't gonna rescue you from Rome but he's gonna rescue you from yourselves. He ain't gonna rescue you from government power, but he's gonna free you from a legalistic lifestyle. He's not gonna come to help you reclaim the promised land, but he's gonna give you prosperity in eternity. But because they were expecting something else, they didn't see God's deliverance in their lives. And our expectations can be so similar. When challenges in our life come, we expect God is gonna act in a certain way on our behalf. We want him to do a certain thing. When we have a virus or we encounter the lockdown, we expect that the method that God is going to save, the method that we want, the method we are looking for is for him to give us health, and safety. We're expecting to bring freedom. When, when we encounter an illness, we, we expect God to move in one particular way, that God's gonna give us healing. When we have a, a job loss or a pay cut, we expect that the Lord is gonna provide for us the exact material possessions that we had before. We expect God to work in a certain way and we want a certain method, just like the Israelites. And God is concerned about our freedom. He is concerned about our health. He cares about our needs. And one day, he will completely restore and take care of all those things. But in the meantime, we wait for heaven In the meantime, as we wait for heaven, he's more concerned about giving us something more enduring than providing us with temporary relief from our current problems and crisis. He wants to be in the crisis with us. He wants to transform our hearts and give us life. If he does just what we expect, if he does the method we've been asking for but does not transform our hearts, We gain, we gain temporary healing without having long-term hope. We get a temporary set of provision without having sustaining long-term peace. We get physical safety without a sense of eternal security. He could deliver us in these ways, but it would only be temporary relief our circumstances would change, but our hearts would remain the same. Let me illustrate this for you. Um, one of the, the hopes over COVID for our little family was we all decided that we were gonna learn how to ice skate. Now, some of you are probably wondering, how can you be a 35-year-old man and live in Alberta and be Canadian and not know how to ice skate? I have no idea. This is just my problem. My children don't know how to ice skate, and so one of my buddies, Justin, came over, and we built a little rink, we filled it up, and we were about ready to embark on the adventure, but I, I decided I wanted to, um, wanted to document the journey, and so I took, a, I took a couple little videos just for you to see how excellent, excellent it started. We are about to embark on the maiden ice voyage, yes, I am wearing head protection, because if you know me, you know I have terrible balance. We'll see if I can still talk and walk after the voyage is done. 
Quick clip, you're probably wondering what happened, and some of you else are wondering, what's up with the nasty stash? <laughs> I cannot answer the stash question. I can tell you what happened. So we, we embarked on this voyage of trying to learn how to ice skate, and it was going pretty good. I was enjoying myself. The kids were enjoying themselves. About 30 minutes in, I was about to get out my phone to take another video. You know, a video of like, how does a 35-year-old who's never skated before become an ice skating sensation? And uh, just to maybe get a couple extra hits on YouTube of how to skate and whatnot. And, and right before I do that, I had a little problem. I caught an edge, my skate stuck in ice, and I totally blew out my knee badly. Was not able to walk for a couple weeks. And some of you are wondering, well, you seem like you're moving really good right now. Well, yes, I am. That is because there's this miracle thing called ibuprofen. And if you pop a few of them, it seems to take the edge off of life. Now, the problem, though, with ibuprofen is this. In the moment, I feel like I can do a lot of things right now. It, it really has relieved the pain quite well. But you and I both know you've experienced this before. After about six to eight hours the effects of the ibuprofen start to wear off. And now, my knee could potentially be in worse shape because of all the dancing around I've done on stage today at about 2 p.m. But it will be in the exact same spot. And why we don't focus on a method is this. Lord, saving a method is because when we look for the method, for God to do it in a certain way, it can be like taking an ibuprofen. We get relief for a little bit of time. But God wants to change our whole heart. He wants to change our whole life. He doesn't just want to give us temporary relief. I'll, I'll frame it in this way. It's, it's like my friend, I got, I got a friend named Gavin. Some of you guys know Gavin. Gavin's a, a 10-year-old. He's becoming one of my heroes. Gavin, earlier this year, was diagnosed with a, a form of cancer that is very aggressive and, and life-threatening. And this fall and winter, he has been in and out of hospital, poke, prodded, chemo, no hair, lots of, lots of challenge. And his mom's been been keeping us up to date on Gavin's journey. And one of the things that's been really clear about Gavin's journey is this little man is full of a ton of faith. And and we we actually, he's got a little nickname. We call him him Gavin the Warrior. And what's what's been neat to see is as Gavin has journeyed, he has come up with some money statements about faith. And in the midst of a really challenging week, in the last bit, in the midst of a, a challenging December where he's had some rush trips to the hospital, obviously we have a, a Christmas that none of us really wanted or desired on how it is. Gavin came up to his mom this week and said this. He said, Mom, I have so much joy in me right now that I don't even care that I have cancer. I am so full of the joy of the Lord that the the cancer seems to be secondary. You see, God wants to give us so much more than temporary relief. He wants to give you what Gavin has, an enduring faith and joy in Jesus Christ in the midst of the chaos surrounding our lives. Yet for many of us, we enter this new year and we, we don't feel like Gavin. We actually relate more with the metaphor in this passage. The landscape that is described as a desert and wasteland feels more like the landscape of our soul. The desert and the wasteland is a picture of our current reality and we listen to this piece of scripture And we hear that the Lord wants to do a new thing, that it's springing up, that he's gonna make a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And we ask ourselves the question, how does someone find water in the wilderness? 
And this water in the wilderness can only come from one place. The joy that Gavin has in the midst of his journey can only come from one place. It can only come from Jesus. In John chapter seven, Jesus says this, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit. When we put our trust in Christ and we believe in him, the Holy Spirit works in our life to transform us. Jesus is the one who transforms any landscape. And if you're here this morning or you're watching online in the landscape of your heart, the landscape of your heart feels like a desert and you are thirsty and longing for life. Call on Jesus, believe in him. Believe that he died and rose for you and choose to follow him and, and receive his living water. Jesus is the only one who can do a new thing in us. Water in the desert is often when our faith is the most vibrant to the world around us, actually. We, we say that we, you know, we're in a desert season, COVID's been a desert season, many of us have experienced a desert season, but when we as followers of Christ have water in the desert, it's vibrant to the world around us. Think about it. When Christians aren't afraid of cancer, when Christians have peace during a virus, when Christians don't panic because of the economic uncertainty, our faith flourishes. And, and many of us have bought into the belief that what the world needs to see is us living on the mountaintop, living large, conquering life. And that's when we have most to offer the world. I don't think that's true. It is when we are in the desert, when we are in the midst of the struggle, and yet in the very midst of the struggle, in the times of deep challenge, that rivers of living water are flowing out of us, that the world goes and looks and says, now there's, there's a Jesus worth following. So my question for us as we think about 2020 is does the desert of COVID-19 or whatever you are facing have a river of water running through it. Is your life flowing with living water? And no matter where you are today, our passage is saying, even if it isn't, if you find yourself today, it's like, it's not flowing. The point of the passage is to say, actually, living water is springing up all around us. We just gotta go for it. Jesus wants to quench our thirst. He's doing a new thing. And the passage wraps up and says this, in the midst of the living water that is around us, in the midst of Jesus being readily available for all of us, verse 22 says this, yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You not called on me, Jacob. Just, that's talking about Israel, the nation of Israel as well. Um, you have not wearied yourself for me. It's like Jesus is saying, I am the way maker. I am the miracle worker. I make streams in the desert and brought water to the wasteland. I have done all this, but you choose not to call on me. You have not wearied yourself for me. And that word wearied yourself, it means you haven't worked hard enough to even grow tired. And, and the language here is, is, is similar to parenting little children, actually. And some of you have little kids. I'm in that season. But all of you have witnessed this at some point in your life. The language here of, you haven't called out to me, you haven't wearied me, it's when kids weary their parents. You've heard this. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Some of you had this today already, actually, and it's driving you bonkers. You're at home trying to watch a sermon, and you've got a child going, mommy, 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 mommy. 
And they go over and over and over again. Pick me up. Give me this. I need you. In my home, we've got a little, little one who's mommy, 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 mommy. I'm hungry. And it's, it's a routine. And you know what? If you do not respond to the mommies, you know what happens. What happens? You don't respond? They keep going. And if you still don't respond, they have a tantrum or they start crying. This is the picture that we're meant to get here. God has living water and is expecting you and I to call out to him, to grow tired in seeking him and trying to find him and asking him for living water. God is saying, if you really believe me that I can give you water in the desert, you would call out or you would work so hard to find me that you would weary yourself. In this desert season of 2020, I have found it very easy to not weary myself with the things of the Lord. I have found it actually easier, I don't know about you, to weary myself, to become wearied by the economic situation of the world or providing for my family and the uncertainty, to become weary about being healthy and staying safe, to become weary about our rights and freedoms and all the things that are going on politically. I think the list could go on. And I wonder, I wonder if as a community, we have become wearied by all of the external and like the Israelites, we have lost sight of calling upon the Lord and wearying ourselves for the things of Jesus. Has all of our weariness caused our love to grow cold? Are we guilty like the Israelites for not calling upon the Lord? Has in this season we've allowed the weariness of everything that's going on around us and paying attention to it for us to get so focused on our own little worlds that we've forgotten about the way maker and what he wants to do in our community. As a church, we're not to grow weary by what makes the world weary. We've been called by Jesus to weary ourselves on one thing, and that is following Jesus. And that is where the living water is. It'll be really interesting to see what 2021 holds. We hope that we won't be laughing at the same memes uh, next year. We're hoping that we won't enter another desert. But let's begin entering into 2021 by remembering that we follow the way maker, by remembering what God has done in the past. What's he done that you need to remember? And some of you, when we took that time to kind of pause and think about what God's done, you, you had a hard time thinking about something. What if 2021 was the year that you asked the Lord to give you a memory? What if 2021 was the year that you, you wearied yourself so that you had something to anchor your faith on? As we look at 2021, what it throws us, let's not settle for an ibuprofen and temporary relief. Let's be like Gavin, having so much joy in us. We don't even care that we have cancer. In our desert, we would be like little kids that cry out for living water, that we would weary ourselves to know Jesus. Finally, I, I just, I think of, 2021 and what my prayer is for the church is that all of the things that have wearied us, COVID related, po the political landscape, the, the argument about our freedoms being infringed on, the, the fear of 
our safety and those things, the things that have wearied us that we've thought about, our finances, it's, it's in the back of our mind. My hope is that we would make a shift in 2021, that what would weary us would not be those external circumstances, but we would decide as a church to enter into 2021 wearying ourselves on the things of the Lord. Because remember, Crossroads Church, we got a vision. And that vision is to give everyone in central Alberta an opportunity to know Christ and by following him, compassionately impact our world. If we would weary ourselves on the Lord, we, we might be able to see the Lord do some great work in the midst of the desert because water would be flowing from us. My second hope would be this. Would we weary ourselves on being the body to one another? You know, there's so much division with everything going COVID. What would it look like for us to put that aside and be united in Christ as brothers and sisters? What it would look like for us to spend this next year wearying ourselves, caring for the lonely and the marginalized in our community? What would it look like this year for us to really rally and be the church? That's my prayer for us as we enter 2021 that we would be able to take our eyes off what is in front of us and we are ourselves for the sake of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today and I, I'm just the first to admit so much of the external circumstances are what I've been wearying myself on. And as we prepare together for 2021, would it be a year uh, that we would be the church and we would weary ourselves on calling out to you and following you, Jesus? And in that, would you do a new thing? Amen.